Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Morning Devotional brought to you by Golden Isles Primitive Baptist Fellowship and produced by HeartFloss TV. I'm V. Vernon Eckleberry, and this morning I have a lesson for you entitled A Love Story That Never Ends. But first, here's a song by Brenda and Vernon that goes along with our two-part series that's a Mother's Day series beginning today and ending next week. And this song goes more with next week's lesson than today. But I hope you enjoy the singing of Not Made With Hands. That goes along with our theme, and as I said, especially next week, part two in this series, A Love Story That Never Ends. And this is designed particularly to go along with Mother's Day 2022. So I'm going to read to you now from the fifth chapter of Ephesians, beginning with verse 22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything." Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. And he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones." And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverences her husband. And so the mystery of which Paul speaks 
is nothing less or more than something that is hidden to the natural world. And in this case, it is the true meaning of marriage. And so we began with the design of marriage and the providential workings of God. God designed the marriage between a man and a woman as an analogy for the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. We find that creation begins with a marriage between Adam and Eve. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, that is Eve, shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And of course, that's used in weddings to this very day. Now, not only does the Bible begin with a marriage, the time of this world ends with a marriage. We read in Revelation 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, that is Christ, for the marriage of the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, and that's the church, and his wife hath made herself ready. So time begins with marriage, ends with marriage, and the whole point is that the institution of marriage is designed to portray the love story between Christ and his church. So, and we see this clearly if we look at the stages of marriage in the Jewish tradition and in Christ's day. And the marriage would begin, the relationship would begin with betrothal. And this is the choice of a bride that was made by the man, and it is with the approval of the father. Now, betrothal pictures the whole body of Christ, his church being chosen by Christ. Jesus said on one occasion in John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And of course, that's a tradition in, in marriage that the, the bridegroom-to-be chooses his wife-to-be. And of course, there is a, a mutual love that must go into that. We know that as well. And so it is that through the Holy Spirit, not only does Christ love us, the church, and choose us, the members of the true church, but the Holy Spirit gives us the love to love Jesus in return. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that the Father is part of the choosing of a bride. It is with his permission that the bridegroom-to-be chooses his wife, and for good reason, so that the choice may be well made. And so we read in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And how is that? according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 3. So there's the betrothal between a man and a woman in the marriage tradition and between Christ and his church in the eternal realm. So it was so then that a carefully selected bride also would love the one who first loved and chose her. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. We choose to love Christ because he first chose to love us. We read that in 1 John 4, 19. And then as part of the betrothal, a price would be negotiated to be paid to the woman's family as a demonstration of the sincerity and the love 
the potential bridegroom has for the daughter uh, of the coming uh, father-in-law. So, for instance, uh, we have many instances in the Bible of that, but one of the most notable in the Old Testament is that love story between Jacob and Rachel. And we find that Jacob paid Rachel's father seven years of labor in exchange for her hand in marriage. And of course, we know that turned out to be 14 years, but nonetheless, that was the negotiated price uh, for the father of Rachel allowing Jacob to have her hand in marriage. So the bride's worth was attached to the amount that was paid to the bride's father. And this was also well known among all the family members and the villagers as well. So it was important then uh, for this negotiated price to speak well of the bride that was being given away. There's a old story about Johnny Lingo. Some of you may have read the short story or even seen one of the movies made about it. Johnny Lingo was one of the sharpest traders in the South Pacific Islands, and he decides to bargain for a wife, and he offers the wife-to-be's father a record of eight cows for Mahana, and she was the least desirable of all the ladies on the island. And this caused quite a stir because uh, everyone knew she could have been purchased for uh, even a chicken. But here Johnny pays the unprecedented eight cows to win her hand in marriage that was paid to her father, and I'm sure he was surprised beyond all belief. So a year later then, Johnny and his wife returned from the, for the first time since their marriage. And everyone finds that something miraculous has happened to Mahana. She is now the most beautiful of them all. And Johnny explains that if he had paid one cow he would have gotten a one-cow wife. But by giving eight cows for Mahana, it proved that she was worth more to him than any other woman on the island. And she responded to that and was indeed an eight-cow wife. Well, that says something about the price that Jesus paid for his beloved, the church. Uh, Johnny Lingo and his eight-cow wife could well represent, be an analogy of Jesus and his wife, the church, because such was Jesus' love for his bride, the church, as unbecoming as her members were, that he gave a gift of infinite value to purchase her for his own. And we read that in our lesson this morning, verse 25, where Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And how much did he love it? And gave himself for it. The ultimate price, as with Johnny Lingo's eight-cow wife, Christ's elect bride was worth nothing in her natural state, but she became a bride of infinite worth because of the price that Jesus paid for her. Listen to this from Romans chapter 5, verse 7. I'll begin at verse 6, rather. For when we were yet without strength, or for anything, anything to recommend ourselves to Christ, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, most undesirable in every respect, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, paid the ultimate price because of his love for his wife. Isaiah records God's words that tell of the husband, the Redeemer, and the church in her natural and in her purchased state. And that's in Isaiah chapter 54. Listen to this. This is through the pen of Isaiah, but quoting the words of God. For thy maker, and that of course is Christ, because by him were all things made. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the one who pays the price to win you, to, to purchase you uh, out of your old estate. That one, thy Maker, who is your Redeemer, loves you that much. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the holy earth, the whole earth, rather, shall he be called. And listen to this. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. Remember Mahana, who was the least desirable in all the village? Well, that's you and me. The Lord has called us, called us to be his bride corporately as his church. The Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. When there was none other to claim the church as its own, and to bless her. And he goes on and writes in a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Now, after the uh, bargaining price was, was paid and the agreement or the covenant made, then it would be signified by the drinking of wine. And at that point, uh, it was never ending. It could never be broken. And so we read in this same 54th chapter of Isaiah, For the mountains shall depart, that is, the world will come to an end someday, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Now Jesus gave the church a perpetual reminder of this betrothal agreement. And this is the meaning of the uh, communion service. For those of you that have always wondered about that, it is to celebrate the agreement that Christ made with his Father, that he would pay the ultimate price to win his church, the beloved, to redeem them, to be his forever. And so the Lord told Paul that we are to do this whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We, he, that is, Jesus took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. This is the agreement. This is the new way that we are gods, not by the law of the Old Testament, but by the love of the new, by the electing grace of the new. And it's sealed, you see, with the blood of Christ, as the marriage was sealed by the drinking of the wine. So we have that. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then it goes on to say, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That is, it's a perpetual reminder of the ultimate price that Jesus paid for his beloved when he shed his blood and died, giving himself for you and me. 
So that's a love story that never ends. And next week we'll look at part two of a love story that never ends.